My name is Alex Hessler and my wife Tiffany and I own Riverstone Organic Farm. Um, we have about 14 acres of certified organic vegetables in Floyd, Virginia. And um, I want to talk to you about uh, this awesome new piece of equipment we just got. Uh, it's called a stone barrier made by a company called Masano. Um, there's other brands that are available, but this is the one we went with. And um, the initial reason why we uh, purchased this piece of equipment is because we're on river bottom land and we actually have quite a bit of stone in our soil. Um, we've been growing here for about four years and it hasn't stopped us from producing you know, decent quality vegetables, but the stones have definitely presented uh, some problems in our production system. Um, first of all, uh, when we uh, create a bed, the stones, uh, many of them, you know, are still on the top of the soil. And so when we use our tractor pulled jang cedar, the stones can be a problem with the cedar um, operating correctly. Um, we have uh, different kinds of mechanical cultivators that hit the stones and get shaken around or, um, you know, are kind of knocked off course and can damage the, the crops. Um, and also in some of our fields where we do uh, intensive direct seeded baby greens with a four row jang seeder, the stones will clog up the seeders. So we have to go through and manually remove them. Um, so that was primarily why we, uh, why we got the stone barrier. But another interesting feature about it is that it buries anything bigger than about the size of, a, of maybe a ping pong ball, uh, maybe slightly larger than that. So that also includes um, root wads and large pieces of residue and crop debris from, um, uh, from a previous crop or in, in a field that you're preparing to plant another vegetable in. Um, it puts all of those uh, things, stones, debris, crop residue, about six inches below the soil surface and leaves a very fine, even, and level seedbed for transplanting laying plastic or direct seeding um, vegetables. Yeah. Uh, in some ways it's similar to a, a rototiller in that there's a central shaft um, with tines that spin uh, very fast you know, with the power of the, tra of the, the tractor. But um, d unlike a rototiller, the tines actually spin in reverse. Um, they're also a little bit more scoop shaped. And what they do is that they uh, grab soil, debris, and stones and throw them backwards against this uh, grate of metal tines. And when a rock or a piece of debris hits those tines, it falls down into the trench that's formed directly behind the, um, the, the blades of the, um, of the tiller. The small fine uh, so soil can pass through the tines and it lands on top of the stones and debris and effectively buries them. And interestingly, this machine works best when there are stones because the stones hitting these tines, which are mounted on a spring coil, causes them to vibrate and shake off any mud or residue that might be accumulating and um, uh, clogging the space in between those tines. So I think we've got just the right amount of stones uh, for, for this machine to work well and to, to justify um, making the expense. There are a number of different configurations that you can get for the machine. Um, we have the raised bed shaper, which just consists of a, of a flat pan with these little paddles on the side that can be adjusted in or out to create a bed. Um, are, that's slightly raised, about six inches, um, as, as wide as you, as you would like it. And the height of that bed can be adjusted by raising or lowering uh, this shaft. Um, but another popular attachment on the back is a heavy roller cage that kind of flattens out the soil and gives you a more firm seed bed. And one thing I've noticed is that the soil, uh, after, the, after we use this machine, is extremely loose and fluffy. And it would probably benefit from maybe a second pass in a couple of weeks with a stale seed bedding tool that kills small weeds that also has a heavy roller that would kind of firm the soil up a little bit more um, so that the, our seeders would, would, um, would operate a little better and the, and the seed to soil contact would be a little firmer. 
Um, and then there's also a depth gauge wheel, which can allow us to determine how deep the machine goes. Um, we've noticed that when we're uh, tilling a field that has a lot of residue like this one here, we kind of need to run it a little more shallowly because there's just so much material churning through this space around the, um, the, the tiller that uh, it, can, it can clog up and the, no soil will pass through the springs. Um, so one thing that we're really excited about is being able to make good quality beds more quickly uh, and with more consistency and, sure, and surety than we have been able to in the past. Like, like many growers, you know, we've made raised beds in a number of steps that include, you know, uh, kind of coarsely throwing the soil up into a pile and then going over it with a bed shaping pan, maybe more than you know, two or three times to get a firm level bed because it's just hard to get that material to, to, to be fine enough and to flow evenly enough to create a, a level bed like this one. Um, so I think that's, it's just gonna remove a lot of time and toil and frustration um, in, in, in this process. Um, obviously removing the stones and, and the debris is gonna have a number of uh, benefits. But the other thing that we're, you know, this is the first week that we've had it, so we're still trying to figure out how it fits into the system. But my feeling is that um, it's gonna cut out a lot of other steps in the tillage process. Whereas before, after I mow a cover crop and disc it in, it might take several weeks of waiting for the, you know, the correct moisture content, waiting on rain and letting the residue decompose and tilling it multiple times with several different implements to create a, a tilth that's um, sufficient enough to make a good raised bed. With this machine, we can do a, a coarse primary tillage um, and then just go through and make and make good quality raised beds. So it, it's going to cut back on the amount of time it takes um, to prepare the soil and cut back on the number of passes. Um, and, you know, similar to a rototiller, it does churn the soil up a lot. Um, and uh, there are long term consequences to, to, you know, tilling the soil again and again and again. Um, but I think in our cover crop heavy system, I see it sort of balancing out. We're able to grow um, high biomass cover crops, perhaps for longer than we normally uh, would have, and and then are able to make good quality beds and grow uh, more consistently, you know, high performing crops. So We're not here's gonna... the field of spring brassicas that we planted in um, early February on beds that we raised with a traditional bed shaper. And everything looks mostly fine, but um, we've cultivated this field once with our finger weeder. And uh, the finger weeder is an excellent tool, uh, but it really requires excellent bed preparation. Um, the, the bed needs to be level and even and symmetrical. Otherwise, it can gouge out the soil if there's you know, too much soil on one side of the bed. Or if there's not enough soil on one side of the bed, then the finger weeders aren't touching the weeds and, and they don't get weeded. Um, another thing that can happen is uh, the fingers can rip out crops if they're not, if they're not on a nice level um, bed surface or they're not, they're not set well in the soil. So um, we finger weeded this once and um, it's not too bad, but we probably killed about 5% of the plants because they were kind of riding on the shoulder of this bed that, um, we tried our best to make uh, even and wide, but we just weren't able to, to do it with, with our tools. Um, and uh, we've had instances where, because the beds weren't consistent, they weren't level, or there was a lot of debris on the surface, where we lost 30% of the crop the first day we ever weeded it, because the crops, the plants got ripped up, or maybe they never even survived the transplanting because they got shoved into you know, clumpy soil and didn't have good um, soil to root ball contact or got shoved against a hard clod. Um, something else that we kind of struggle with is that we have these grassy alleyways that we use for, for harvesting and, and spraying. 
and if we don't lay our beds uh, perfectly in the field, the outer bed can kind of get pushed a little bit up into the um, alleyway. And if you suck any um, any grass or uh, you know unmowed cover crop like we kind of have on the edge of this field into the bed, then you end up trying to transplant or seed onto it, and that can be that's problematic. But the stone barrier just sucks it in and buries it six inches deep and, and it, it, you never would even notice uh, that it happened. So here's a field where we have two beds um, that we made before we got the stone barrier um, and we planted beets in them. The beets look great, but um, the, the shoulder of the bed is kind of sort of non-existent and um, you know, the, 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 uh, there's a lot of clumps and, and rocks on the bed surface um, and uh, it'll be a little bit problematic to, to keep this weeder without having to come out here and, and do a little bit of hand weeding to touch up where the finger weeder missed. Now contrast that with these beds to my left that we just built with the stone barrier. barrier. There's zero stones on the surface, there's zero clumps, um, the beds are completely level, they're pool table level. Um, the width is consistent the entire length, uh, and when we seed uh, our next round of beets into these, I'm just have a lot more confidence in the ability of these beets to germinate uh, evenly and consistently, and our ability to follow up with um, our cultivators and cultivate the soil thoroughly without leaving weeds that we have to come back and we 